good evening, everybody. We're just going to give everybody a few minutes to join the webinar. We're looking forward to having everybody here with us tonight. Turning off my uh, ringer. It is my pleasure. I'm Alexis Rothenberg, Executive Director of Alumni Relations here at Mercy University. And it is our pleasure to have My Money Workshop offer a tax, kind of prepping for the tax season workshop. And we're thrilled our guest speaker is a Mercy alum. Elizabeth Brown is class of 1984 and is a leading practitioner in the field of financial empowerment. Upon graduating from Mercy, she started her career as an auditor for Pete, Martwick, and Mitchell & Co., which is now KPMG, and then in 1995 started her own tax and consulting firm, as well as a life coach training program. It is our pleasure to have Elizabeth here with us tonight. We will be recording this and we'll share out the webinar at the end, and if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and chat, and we will get to them at the end of the program. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Hey, nice to be here, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. So we're going to go through these slides about tax time. And um, I did get, I just got a list of your questions. So we're going to save all the questions for the end of the slides uh, show, the slide deck, because I'd like to refer back some of the answers. We're going to refer back to the, to the slides. So here we go. You can advance the slides. My name's Elizabeth Brown, and I am a volunteer instructor with My Money Workshop. And My Money Workshop is a nonprofit organization that educates people to manage their finances wisely and to make a lifetime of informed decisions. Please note, we pro can you go back? We provide the information for educational purposes only, and we do not intend or this should not be considered advice with respect to your personal finances. Next slide. So today's objectives are we're going to prepare for the 2023 tax filing date. We're going to discuss the different types of taxes and the purposes of those taxes. And we're going to explain why managing your taxes is an essential part to your financial wellness. Next slide. So this is like our financial wellness plan. Okay, there's all these. So mindset, I think we all can agree that our mindset has a lot to do with executing any type of plan or even creating a plan. So when we cover mindset in a uh, workshop, specifically, we talk about dreams, visions, setting goals, and changing our habits. And then another part of that is budgeting and saving, creating a budget, tracking your expenses, and saving regularly. We, do a, we have a module on banking. Uh, we have a module on credit and debt management. And then we have a module on investing. And within that, retirement taxes and strategies, we're gonna be covering tonight taxes. So that's sort of our broad view of what a financial wellness plan looks like. Next slide. So our financial wellness checklist, right? Dream, dream big, set goals, take action. So financial vision, having smart goals, creating a budget, tracking expenses, key, managing a budget, having a bank account and saving on a regular basis and managing your debt, uh, credit and your credit score. And of course, taxes. So there are national standards for personal financial education. And this, mod, this uh, webinar meets all those uh, standards. So that's what this is about. Um, how uh, most income is taxed by the government and um, what net income is, take home pay, your wages, your payroll tax deductions. Who's required to pay taxes? What type of income are you required to pay taxes on? And what the government does with the taxes, how your taxes go to work for you. So this year, our taxes are due April 18th not April 15th. So we have uh, 
I get to work an extra weekend, boo-hoo. <laughs> but April 18th of 24 is the deadline to either file your taxes or if you're going to file an extension, you need to do that by April 18th. If you're going to owe, you still have to pay your taxes by April 18th, but you don't have to finalize and wrap up your whole return for six months. So you get an extension until October 18th. It's usually October 15th. And I would say it's still October 15th. So I was going to have people raise their hand. I'm not going to see it, but raise your hand if you've ever struggled with filing your income tax return. I did get some questions about people wanting to learn how to do it on their own and good for you. That's awesome. But I think we could all say that filing a return income tax return uh, initially is, is a challenge. So hopefully we're not really covering the tax return, but um, it's kind of a step towards that, I would say. So what are taxes? Our taxes are mandatory contributions that are levied on individuals or corporations, right? By government entities. There's local, regional, or national taxes. They collectively fund the government, their spending, their public expenditures, and they're used as a way to regulate or reduce negative alternatives, for example, pollution. They provide re revenue for governments to fund essential services that benefit all citizens, defense, roads and highways, um, first responders, firefighters or police officers, public transportation, schools, libraries, and justice system. And I'll tell you a little story about taxes. I have a niece who lived in, Chicago, in Illinois that had a state tax and she moved to Florida that doesn't have a state tax. And I'm a little appalled at how many things she doesn't have, like a decent library, at least where she lives, a decent library for my nephew. Um, and I realize when you don't pay state taxes in some states, I can't speak for all the states that don't pay have a, a state tax, you 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 lose out on some of these benefits. I think we take for granted here in New York um, that we have all these you know, New York libraries, like an amazing library. You know, that's that's funded by taxes. Our roads, our education, our, our first responders. Where I live in Westchester County. In a lot of the towns, the uh, fire department is volunteer, but the state, you know, but our local taxes do help support them, but it's a volunteer system. So um, that's just my little thing about states that don't pay taxes. Next slide. So there's different types of taxes um, and different types of income. So self-employment income is, um, you know, people who are work for themselves. OK, sales are paid on purchases like car, clothes. It's a sales tax. Um, property taxes, if you own a home, there's property taxes. Payroll taxes, if you're an employer or even if you're self-employed. Well, really, for an employer, payroll taxes. If you're self-employed, you, you, we don't really call it a payroll tax, but there is a tax for that, which we'll talk about. Capital gains and dividends, you have to pay tax on those. And those are from investments like stocks and mutual funds. There's an estate tax. Um, that's a tax that's paid on the value of a person's estate. It's currently just under 13 million. That's gonna change for 24, but right now it's just under 13 million. If your estate is, is at that level, then anything above that, you're gonna be subject to estate tax. And then there's gift tax, which is for anyone who makes a gift over 17,000. But just to clarify on that, if you make gifts during your lifetime, you don't really pay tax at the time. You have to file a gift tax return and that gets tracked so that when you when you die and you have your estate, that 13 million, they're gonna back out of that all the gifts you've given and then they're gonna look at the difference because you kind of like using your estate, it's called using your estate exemption. So those are the types of uh, taxes that we're gonna talk a little bit about. So can anybody name one source of money that you do not have to pay taxes on? And I'll let the people who are monitoring the chat, let me know if anybody comes up with any guesses. Ooh, yeah, I see the answer. I don't know how many people said that.
So, so the next slide will tell you that the one that we were talking about was life insurance. So life insurance, you do not have to pay taxes on. And that's different than if you inherit money, right? So that's different. Usually the estate is paying tax on the inherited money. Um, so usually inherited uh, proceeds, you also don't pay tax on because the estate is paying tax on them. So let's talk a little bit about the taxing agencies. So we have the Internal Revenue Service. I think everybody is familiar with the IRS. They're, they are the U.S. government agency that's responsible for collection of federal taxes and the enforcement of the federal tax laws, which were established in 1862 by Abraham Lincoln. That's a little factoid. Um, and it operates under the state's Department of Treasury. So that's how our federal tax works. In the state, in our state, New York State Department of Taxation and Finance is... Um, the agency, and then the city has New York City uh, Department of Taxation and Finance. And as I indicated earlier, not all states have an individual income tax. Florida, Texas, and Nevada do not. Um, we here in New York have a local tax. If you live in Yonkers, there's a tax. And if you live in the city, there's a tax. And then there are other cities around the country that have a tax. So one of the important things is to understand the deductions that are listed on your paycheck when you work. So you're going to have on your pay stub, which we'll look at in a minute, a federal tax, what's called Social Security and Medicare. They're sometimes referred to collectively together as FICA tax, uh, state taxes. And then if you live in one of the municipalities, like New York City or Yonkers, there's going to be a tax there. And those are automatically deducted from your paycheck. And they are based, usually you have to fill out a form when you um, get hired, which is always confusing for people. It's like a best guess that they could come up with. And based on how you fill out that form, that's how they're going to withhold the taxes. So your gross income is your salary before you have taxes taken out. And your net income are the taxes, is, is your take-home pay after taxes. And it's important to look at the deductions on your stub because sometimes there's mistakes, but also just to get a sense of, you know, how much you're paying. So everybody who earns money in the U.S. pays federal income tax and most states charge state tax as well as we just had discussed. They're automatically deducted from your pay stub, your gross and your net we talked about. So again, you're gonna hear gross and net, those are terms that you're gonna hear a lot. When you get hired and you're given a salary, that's your gross. Or if you're having getting an hourly rate, that's your gross. But then you have to pay taxes and see what you're gonna take home on that. Next slide. So here's a sample of a weekly paycheck, right? So over on the top left, you have your regular time, your overtime, holiday, different things and they usually give you your current amount and then your year to date amount so you can track where you are year to date. And then over to the right are the deductions, right? Federal withholding, Social Security and Medicare, um, New York State income, uh, state unemployment insurance, state disability tax, okay? Disability is a tax that would come out. Your uh, unemployment insurance is paid by the employer so that's usually not on your paycheck. And then you have um, some other kind of more specific to you uh, uh, deductions like a 401k. These can be pre-tax, okay, a 401k, life insurance, a loan, dental, an HMO, uh, dependent care, FSA. Depending on how your employer is structured, some of these things can be packaged into a pre-tax um, benefit so that you don't really pay tax on them you pay tax on the net of them so basically you save money that way and that's you see over on the bottom right is your gross then after all your deductions you end up with your net pay and that's what people you know 
need to budget on is your net pay. That's important when we cover our budgeting module, which isn't part of this, but you know, net pay is an important number to look at because that's really what you have to work with. So that's a sample pay stub, but I have a feeling a lot of you are familiar with that. Now, when you work for yourself, you have to pay. So let's go back to that pay stub for a minute. So the social security and Medicare tax, that is the employee portion of the tax that you have to pay as the employee. The employer behind the scenes, you don't see it, they have to match that. They have to pay their portion of the tax. It's the same rate. But when you're self-employed, right, you can go back to the next slide now. You're both the employer and the employee. So you get to pay both pieces, okay, which comes out to 15.3%. 12.4 is for Social Security and 2.9 is for Medicare. So you, as a 1099, if you're, if you're, uh, if you receive a 1099 instead of a W-2, you're technically self-employed. And you should know when you're negotiating your rate as a 1099, you have to pay um, an extra seven point whatever, six, five percent in taxes because you're paying the employer part too. So I always encourage people to negotiate a little bit of a higher rate because you have to pay more tax uh, out of it. That person who's paying you as a 1099, they're saving the employer portion of Social Security and Medicare. They're saving it, you're paying it. So you wanna get a little bit of a higher rate to offset that if you can. Now, your employer, when you're a W-2, when we look at the pay stub, when they pay their portion of that tax, they get to deduct it as an expense on their corporate tax return so when you're self-employed, if you look at the last bullet point here, you also get to deduct that employer portion as a, as a deduction on your uh, tax return. And your tax return could be if you file a 1040 and you're not incorporated or you don't have a partnership or something like that, you're going to file something called a Schedule C on your 1040. And that tax that's calculated, the employer portion shows up as a deduction later on on the tax return. So um, that's a little bit about uh, entrepreneurs' taxes. Next slide. So apparently there was a video there, which I'm not. But I, I don't know if that we need it, so it's okay. If you can't get it going. So these are just the tax brackets. And by the way, I just want to say that both the IRS and New York State have phenomenal websites. There's nothing you can't find on there. All of this stuff is on there if you need to look things up. The internet, you know, is awesome. So they really do have good websites. And, um, you know, you can get a lot of your questions answered uh, by going to the website. But basically your tax... Your taxes, we have different rates depending on your income, where you fall, okay? So over on the right, you see the lowest tax bracket is 10%. And then down at the bottom right, the highest rate is 37%. So we've all heard the saying, the more you make, the more you take. And this is a pictorial version of that. This is, you know, the more you make, the more they take. It's a progressive tax system. And New York State has their own tax brackets. I think they have like nine tax brackets. So again, you could find their, these on, on the website. They're in the instructions and everything. Next slide. So who's required to file a tax return? So if you have children um, who are still dependents, they may have to file a tax return if they make more than a certain amount of money. Each state, and the IRS have different criteria. For example, the IRS, so federally, if you made more than 12,950, which is the standard deduction in 23, then you have to file a tax return. But in New York state, if you made 4,000 or more, you have to file a tax return. So you could be in a situation where you're filing a state, a New York state tax return, but you don't need to file a federal one. And then sometimes, like this happens a lot with, um, people in high school that have a part-time job, they have a minimum amount of taxes coming out. At the end of the year, they're really not gonna owe any taxes. In fact, they're, prob they're in most probably entitled to get that money back, but you can't get it back unless you file a tax return. So 
sometimes people are just filing a tax return just to get the employer withholding back. So you want to find an inexpensive way to do that because if you're paying um, a CPA or someone like that to do it, the cost to have the return done could be more than the uh, refund that you're entitled to. But we're going to talk about a little later on some of the free um, tax return um, opportunities that are out there. Next slide. So we have um, some child tax credits. There's a new child tax credit for parents with children under the age of 18. And this is the first year where uh, children 17 will be able to receive that tax credit. Um, families with children under six will receive a little bit more, 3,600 per child. And then uh, uh, those with school aid children over six get 3,000 per child. Again, it depends on how much money your parents make. So there's those are the brackets for that. I'm not gonna read them all, but they're there. So at a minimum, if you're single and you make 70 up to make below 75 or up to $75,000, you will get the full credit. Um, but as your income goes up, I think the cutoff for that is 95,000. You're gonna to start to lose that credit incrementally. And then it's doubled for couples. So, um, so anyway, those are guidelines, whether or not you're gonna apply, if you, whether you will apply for the credit. And you don't have to be employed to receive the child credit. So um, if you have no income, you would then want to file a return. Here's another reason to file a return, even if you have no income, is if you would qualify for this credit, you need to file the return to get the credit. So, and then unemployment tax is fully deductible. I don't know if you remember, there was a period, I forget what year at this point, um, I think it was 20, um, because of COVID, like unemployment tax wasn't taxable, but it's everything's back to being fully taxable. And you should be careful and make sure you have taxes withheld. A lot of people don't realize it's taxable. Plus, they're unemployed, so they need as much cash flow as they can have. So they make an incorrect decision in a lot of cases not to have any taxes withheld. And then when they come and do their tax return, they owe money. So I, I encourage people to have some taxes withheld from your unemployment checks when possible. And they should, you know, I know in New York State, they give you the opportunity to do that. That is an option. All right, what else do we need to know? So much to know here, so much to know. Next slide, let's see. On filing late or not filing a tax return at all. So penalties for filing late, there are penalties for filing late returns. And there are, is interest on outstanding tax balance. Remember, I, we talked about that for this year, for the 2023 tax year, April 18th, is the deadline to either finalize your tax return or file for an extension. But you have to pay the tax that you think you're going to owe. When you finalize that return in October or any time between April and October, if you ended up owing money a little bit more, like you just didn't calculate it exactly, you're going to have to pay interest on that. Something that a lot of people don't know, maybe you guys know that, I'd be curious to see who knows this. If you're not gonna owe money, if you're entitled to a refund, you don't have to file by April 18th. There'll be no penalty for filing late. You won't get your refund, but there's no penalty for filing late. That penalty is really for people who owe taxes. So if you know you're getting a refund, you have to be a, a thousand percent sure, and you're just having a, a tough time in April and you're not gonna get the return done till later, it's fine. Um, but a lot of people think, regardless, that you have to get it in by April uh, April 15th. Um, other consequences for unpaid taxes, they can put a lien on your bank account or your home. It can be sent to collections. You can get uh, not be able to review your passport if you have one. And they can put a lien on any future tax refunds that you might have. So the IRS doesn't mess around, nor does New York State. They want their taxes. And if you owe taxes, you should pay them. Otherwise, they're going to make your life miserable. Next slide. So we talked about um, what you need to file a return. OK, so you need your W-2 if you're an employee. Obviously, your legal name and address and a social security number. Those are like the, the key things. If you're um, Getting 1099s, if you're self-employed or doing like independent contractor work, you have to get your 1099s. You need all those. 
and you know you start accumulating all that and then you will have to you know accumulate all that when you have that all together you file your return now the irs does have um on their website a way to file for free um i do not suggest that you mail a paper copy although probably a lot of people do um because it just the irs is struggling right now and they're so overwhelmed they've been losing a lot of stuff so if you do have to file a paper copy, make sure you keep records of everything. That goes with anything, right? You send anything to a third party. You want to have a good record for yourself in case it gets lost or you need to follow up on it. But we will look at, again, uh, some of the free ways that you can file a tax return. Next slide. So these are links to get to the 1040 and the instructions and also for New York State, like I told you. The, the websites are chock full of information, chock full of information. And again, I think both New York and the feds, definitely the feds, I think New York State too has a way to file online. And then a lot of post office and libraries have the forms. But again, you can get them online. But if you don't have access to a computer, then you go to the post office or the library. Next slide. So these are some of, there's apps and there's software. So what's the difference between an app and a software? All your younger people know that. I had to think about that. But an app is something that you could do on like your tablet versus software you would do on a PC. You know, it's full blown. But um, so some of the apps, the best mobile apps that are out there, TurboTax, H&R Block, Tax Act Express, and Cash App which was formerly Credit Karma is completely free. The other three have a small fee. Um, Cash app is, is completely free. And then the best tax softwares, some of the similar companies, H&R Block, TurboTax, TaxLayer, um, Cash app. But again, there's, there's a small fee for them. And when we took, I know some of your, I will answer this question now because it's on here. Um, because we're on the slide, some of you asked, you know, that you have your father, or you have had people helping you do your taxes, and you want to start learning how to do them yourself. This is a great way to do it. And um, you could take, let's say you had it prepared by someone else last year, get, buy the software for last year, and attempt to put in the numbers yourself and see how your tax return looks compared to the one that was prepared for you. So you can get a sense of how what you're inputting comes out. And then um, you can, if it works and you feel comfortable, then you can start doing this every year. So um, that's one of the ways that you can do that. It's just taking that first step of, you know, getting over the hump. And if, if your dad has been helping you, because several people mentioned their dad or a third party, especially if it's your dad, ask him to show you. I mean, he's going to help you educate. If he knows how to do it, he can teach you. These are the things you need. Here's where you input them and all that stuff. But I think it's great for you guys who want to learn how to do it yourself because it's important. Next uh, slide. So today's key messages are, remember, if you owe taxes, if you're going to owe money, you, should, you have to file by April 18, 18th or get your extension in by April 18th. When you start getting paperwork from your, or you, a lot of it comes electronically now, you know, start, don't lose it. You know, start accumulating, come up with a safe place. If you're getting it all electronically, save or create a folder on your desktop uh, with all your tax records and keep it all in there. Uh, research, identify and utilize tax tools best suited for your needs. We talked about some of those in the previous slide and take advantage of free tax resources in your communities, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. So those are some of the key messages. We'll go to the next slide now. We'll, let's go through this before we get to the questions and answers. So my, just a little bit on uh, following us I, at My Money Workshop. We're on Instagram, um, LinkedIn, Facebook. We've got, um, I, Marisol can talk a little bit about that if there's time at the end of all the social media that we're, we're involved in, but stay in touch because we've got a lot of good programs that we offer. Woohoo! refund coming. Okay, let's look at some of the additional post-workshop resources.
So free tax resources. So the IRS website, okay, and New York State also has a, a filing center. The city of New York has one. Uh, the USA.gov is a website, I guess, that you could, um, I haven't been on that one to see what they, how they help you with taxes. And then there's a lot of local nonprofit organizations that are set up during specific times during tax season that you could go to for help in preparation of your return, which I think are on the next slide. So one of the big ones is the IRS's Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. It's called VITA and Tax Counseling for the Elderly, TCE programs. They're, they offer free basic return preparation for qualified individuals. So what's a qualified individual? Um, people who generally make less than $57,000 a year. If you are a person with disabilities and you have limited uh, English speaking skills, uh, they will help you. So they have people that speak um, different languages. You don't have to meet all those three requirements, but you have to make under 50, usually under $57,000 or less. Um, let's see, in addition to VITA, the TCE program offers free tax help, particularly for those who are 60 years of age and older, specializing, specializing in questions about pensions and retirement related issues unique to seniors. So that, I showed a lot of questions on that. So that's a great um, opportunity for you. That's free, that's available. And they're generally located at community and neighborhood centers, libraries, schools, um, but look them up. There's a, we have a locator tool and uh, also on the IRS website, you could Google VITA or TCE programs and in your area, say if you're in the city, I don't know where, I, I'm in Westchester County and they'll give you the locations and they give you the hours. Uh, and some of them you have to make an appointment. I think a lot of them you have to make an appointment ahead of time. But those are really awesome free free services. Ah, Mercy has one starting in the winter. Awesome. And I'm just curious, Alexis, is that, do you have to be either a student or alum? Or is that open to the general public? That is open to the general public, but it is marketed specifically to students and all. Okay, so that's awesome. I don't know, did you student? That's great. So there you go. Next slide, please. So when looking for TCE sites, keep in mind that the majority of the sites are operated by uh, AARP, founda the Foundation's Tax Aid Program. So again, you can look it up that way. Um, there's a locator tool there for them specifically. Um, at the selective sites, taxpayers also have an option to prepare their own basic federal and state return for free using a web-based tax preparation software. So they're like, help you learn. So I told you there's free uh, software on the New York State and IRS site. Sounds like they will help you learn how to do that at one of these centers. So then you can learn how to do it on your own eventually. So, but the option is only available at locations that list self prep in the site listing. So that's really good. If you wanna start using the free software, if you meet the criteria for the free software on the IRS uh, is website, certain centers will help you learn how to walk through that process, doing it uh, yourself online. And then you're, then you're good to go, hopefully. Um, please also review the other online resources and tax help tools on the irs.gov website, including tax forms, instructions and publications, online payment methods, and options to file with the IRS for free. So again, on the bottom of this, we have another link for the VITA NTC locator tool or the AARP state site locator tool. And they're updated. These these uh, uh, locator tools are updated throughout the filing season. So check back if you don't see something nearby. The first time you look, it may be available as you get closer into the height of tax season, like you know March and April. Next slide. So just to re reiterate, you know, look for what's free in your community. There's a lot available there. New York State's 
filing requirement is you have to be under $72,000 or less to use their free uh, website-based filing uh, software. Oh, so they're both under 72. So the federal and the state are both under 72. I, it was the VITA program where you had to be under 57. And there's, um, again, a link to the IRS site. But, you know, you can Google. You can Google all this IRS free filing. You'll get right to the web page that talks about that. And if you don't have your own personal computer, you know, you can go to the to the library and, and get information, too, using their computers. But there really is so much available to you. I think back to the 80s when, you know, it was all forms and it was just it was so it seems now so archaic. Um, but, you know, that's the way it was. Next slide. So I think we're done on that. So we'll go to uh, questions and answers. Um, I've highlighted some of the questions. Like I said, I didn't really have a lot of time to look at these. And then we can also open it up to any questions um, that you might have if you didn't have a chance to submit your question to um, Alexis. So the, one of the questions is, I would like to know if it's necessary to make tax deposits on the 18,000 annual independent contractor pay that I receive. So absolutely, positively, yes. This falls into the category of being an entrepreneur where you have to pay at a minimum the 15.3% FICA taxes, both, so that includes the employer and employee piece. And that tax, you know, with, with federal income tax, which is different than this is the FICA tax, federal income tax, you get to deduct from your income from the 18,000, your standard deduction. So you're only, which is like 12,950. So you only pay tax on the difference. But with FICA taxes, you pay it regardless. You could have $100,000 of deductions, you're gonna pay your FICA tax. So at a minimum, whoever submitted this question, at a minimum, you have to pay the 15.3 tax on this, work that into your estimates, and then do a projection of your taxes. I, I don't know if you have any other income or whatever, but you're gonna owe federal tax and state tax too. So, but at a minimum, um, get that FICA in, and make those deposits. You don't want to, you, you'll not only owe at the end of the year, if you don't, you'll have to pay interest because they want, when you're self-employed like that, they want it in quarterly. They want their money in quarterly. They don't like to get it all at the end of the year. You can get away with it, but they're gonna charge you interest. So that's that question. Another question was how to save on taxes when taking out a required minimum distribution. So for those of you who don't know what that is, when you reach, it's now 71 and a half, I think, um, you have to start withdrawing a required minimum distribution from your re, from your retirement accounts. And um, and then you pay tax on that. But it, so one way that you could save taxes on that, if you didn't need the money, you can have your required minimum distribution go directly to a charity. And instead of taking the money and then putting it to the charity and getting a deduction for that, it's more beneficial to have it go directly to the charity and then you don't have to pay taxes on it. So that was uh, one way that you could save money on that. Um, how do I shift from relying on my dad to do my taxes to independently understanding how to do taxes? I would say find one of these Vitus um, sites that, have, they, that say self prep and they will show you how to utilize the software on the federal um, website on the IRS's website to learn how to start doing them. That's the first step is I would encourage you to do that. And if you don't have a site with you, maybe you and your dad together can do it online the first time from the IRS website and he can help you, you know, see how that works. Hopefully he's not opposed to you uh, doing it on your own because sometimes dads like to know that they're taking care of us. Okay. Is it better to pay higher taxes during the year? So that's that's all the question is, but I'm assuming what you're saying is, is it better to overpay and get a refund versus underpay and owe money? And, you know, 
I'd say try to get it right. You know, you certainly don't want to pay. I don't, I ha, I used to have clients that would get a $10,000 refund at the end of the year. Every year, they have way too much coming out of their, their pay. And I would tell them, why are you doing this? And they'd say, because I won't save it. I don't have the discipline to save it during the year. So they basically left it with the IRS and then they would get it at the end of the year and they looked forward to it and that's how they did it. I don't really like that because you could be earning interest on that money if you had it, right? It would be in your bank account earning interest. So you're kind of giving the IRS a, a tax-free loan, in my opinion. So, I mean, you don't, it's okay to be a little bit over if you're not sure you want to, you know, be conservative and err on the side of getting a little bit of money back, but I'm not a fan of huge refunds, but some people need to do that. If you really can't save money and this is what works for you, then, you know, it's really, really a personal decision. That's what it comes down to. Okay. Let's see. My husband and I have always had a tax expert prepare the taxes and we want to complete them ourselves. What are some tips? So in this, again, in this case, Again, I would take, let's say you had a professional do your return in 2022. I would take all the documents that you gave that prepare in 2022 and go onto the IRS's website for 20, you know, and pull up the 2022 software and see if you can start doing it yourself and then compare it to the, how the tax preparer did it to see, you know, if you're coming out with the same numbers. So that's my suggestion on that. Um, okay, so this is another, these are some sophisticated questions. Taking deductions for charity contributions, offsetting stock gains. So another thing you can do is you could, you could contribute appreciated stock directly to the charity. You can tell your broker, so let's say you have Apple stock and it's, you got a lot of gain on it and you don't want to pay tax on the gain. You can deduct, you can contribute directly to the charity whatever dollar value that comes out to be that you want. So let's say you wanted whatever, $5,000 or whatever, have your broker, uh, you know, batch up $5,000 worth of that stock with the gain in it and you send it off directly to the charity and then you don't have to pay tax on the gain. So I think that's what you're referring to in that question. Um, now, these are some questions that I just can't answer you. So like, how much withholding do you have if you make over 150 a year? So that's, it's not black and white because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of variables into how much taxes you have withheld. For example, are you single? Are you married? Are you head of household? Each one of those categories have has a different tax based on the same amount of income. It's a different tax uh, rate. Also, do you own a home? Do you have deductions like that? Or are you just taking the standard deduction? So I really, you know, that I can't really answer that because there's a lot of moving parts. Um, what are some expenses that are considered deductible as an educator? Well, now there is, again, I don't have any teachers in my practice for a long time, but I, there is a basic, if I recall, I think it still exists, a $300 deduction for every anyone who's a teacher. Um, otherwise, you have to itemize, which means, um, so we all get a standard deduction, but if you have, if you own a home and you pay real estate taxes, especially in New York, taxes, those are high, and you have medical expenses, and if you have travel deductions, you itemize, which means you follow Schedule A. So, um, and they're really limited too, so you, the honest truth is most people do not get a benefit for the little bit amount, the few hundreds of dollars that you incur as a teacher. It's a shame, which is why they created that above the line deduction, which I, I think is still there. Um, so you can take a look at that. Uh, what is the best approach? Married filing jointly or married filing separately? So this is another interesting question. So. You get penalized if you're married and you file separate returns. You actually pay more tax that way. Um, and you can't itemize as well. So if you own a home, if you have a lot of itemized deductions where you're gonna do that schedule A that I just referred to, you gotta be careful. The One of the reasons why 
it, would, it could work for somebody to do that is, is one of the uh, taxpayers had really high medical expenses. That would be an example. So high, I mean, basically you have to crunch the numbers. You have to do the return one way versus the other way because if they were really high medical expenses, your medical expenses are limited to a percentage of your adjusted gross income. So if you have uh, one of your one of the spouses has less income, so that limitation would be less, meaning you'd get more benefit from the the um, medical deduction. Um, it might it might work out, but usually it's not a good idea to do that. I need to know more why that person would want to do that. But the fact that they knew there was an option is 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 good. <laughs> um, Let's see. Why do I have to continue filing taxes after my retirement? Well, it depends. You might not have to. It depends on, you know, like my grandmother didn't file for years because she had so little in Social Security. She didn't even meet the, the requirements to file a return. It depends on your income. If you have a big 401k and you're withdrawing from that, the required minimum distributions that I referred to earlier, you can, and it's more than the standard deduction, you're going to have to pay taxes on it. It's it's all about what I said on one of the slides, the more you make, the more they take. So it's really, it depends is the answer. It depends. Mm. Can you write off travel for your volunteers and organization? You can. I don't know off the top of my head what the rate is. 11 cents, I forget. Look it up. You can Google it. It's it's there. You can write off your travel um, miles you get a certain uh, amount of cents per mile you have to keep track of it keep a log but if you're driving back and forth for a volunteer you can definitely get a um, you have to itemize your deductions though you see you have to file that schedule a um when filing a loss hmm. would filing a loss for a new direct sales business, waive a red flag when included with other docs for an existing S corp return. If you had a loss, you had a loss. Um, at some point, though, you have to show that you're a viable business or it could be considered a hobby. Um, and you're limited on your loss. This is more complex with an S an S uh, return. You're limited. Your losses are limited. If you put money in and you have loan to offset it. That's a more complicated uh, question, and it depends on several things. Another thing that has um, moving parts. So I think those were the big main ones that jumped out at me. If there are other questions that I that anybody has, I'll Elizabeth, do my best we just to try got to one that them. came in from the chat. Is can you start an IRA after you retire and are receiving a pension? Um. Mm, Let me take a quick peek. Give me another question while I look that up. And then I think there was a couple on here, and maybe kind of along the same lines, not quite as how to save on taxes when taking out your RMDs. Well, that's I covered that. So what oh, okay. of the ways was well, one of the ways was, I mean, you can't save on taxes if you owe money. You owe money, but to avoid the tax, you can put a piece of your RMD if you can't do all of it directly to a charity, you send it directly to the charity and you're not taxed on it. I want to make sure that they understand that, whoever asked that question. And as far as claiming kind of, I guess, adult children as dependents, is there an age cutoff or how does that? There is, and again, that's all on the website. It depends, you know, do they live in, the, do they spend half the year in your home? Let me just see if I have that handy. So ask the question again. Is you know is there an age limit for claiming kind of adult children as dependents? There's no age limit, but there are requirements of how much money they make, how they have to have lived with you, you know that type of thing. So if you have your 26 year old came back to live with you because they couldn't find work, and they are living in your house and they are not making any money, um, and they are your child could be a relative, it could be, you know, there's different types of relatives that qualify, then you could claim them as a dependent, yes. What else? 
There's no, they're kind of along those same lines. I file head of house with one adult dependent, but at a higher single rate. My son just started working this month. Does he have to file and can I still use him for HOH filing for 2023? Again, it depends on how much money he's making. So, but again, you could find that that's easy to Google and find on the RS website and you'll see where you fall in the chart. You know, they'll say, what about this? Then do this. I think those are all of our questions this evening. Okay. I don't have an answer for the IRA after retirement. I should, but I don't have that answer. So um, I can either get back to you. If you're able to look it up when we send this update, we can certainly share that. Okay. I will do that. Give me the question again. After retirement, can you still put into an IRA? Correct. If working? Can you start an IRA after you retire and are receiving a pension? I think you can, but let me let me double check that. Let me double check that. So I hope that was informative. Thank you so Great much. Great questions. We truly appreciate your help and support this evening, and this was incredibly informational for everybody. Great. I'd love to do this every year if you're a little more uh, into it. Absolutely. Thank you. Marisol, do you want to add anything for My Money Workshop before we wrap up? No, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, we look forward to bringing uh, more content in the balance of the uh, academic year. And a great big thank you uh, to the Mercy University team for having us back this year. Thank you both so much. Go Mercy! Go Mercy! <laughs> Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. And happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes, that's right. Happy Thanksgiving. We have to start. I have to start thinking that we're getting into the holidays. We're or turning I'm, that corner right now. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm in denial. Uh, <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you, too. Elizabeth. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Alexa. Thanks. Are you